The Hammerklavier Sonata is like a musical Mount Everest towering high above the rest of the cycle. The rest of the cycle in its entirety is akin to a journey around the world, so much richness it contains. And here, towards the end of the journey, we also have this incredible challenge to ascend, to climb, to experience. It was not only a challenge for performers ever since the time Beethoven has written it, but it was a challenge for Beethoven himself. It took him the better part of a year to write that sonata, and at the time he had not written much else. And it was as if after the Hammerklavier all the floodgates have been broken open, and out of Beethoven came both the monumental works of his last years, the Missa Solemnis, the Ninth Symphony, the Diabelli Variations, and the transcendent and intimate works like the last three sonatas and the late string quartets. So the Hammerklavier, its greatness is not just in itself, which we will discuss right now, but as a gateway to the transcendent last years of Beethoven's creative output. A small aside about the nickname itself, Hammerklavier. Hammerklavier in German means a hammer piano, so a keyboard instrument with hammers. And it was an idea of Beethoven to replace for a short while the Italian titles that usually would say Sonata per il pianoforte, to replace them with a German text, Eine Sonate für das, a Sonata for the, and he wasn't sure how to call this instrument in German. And finally he settled on the word Hammerklavier. And um, this name was used for two sonatas, number 28 and number 29, our sonata. And only with sonata number 29, the case remained that we use this as a nickname to this day. And I want to say for what it's worth that as nicknames go, this is a regrettably prosaic one. If you think of the moonlight, the pathetic, the pastoral, the appassionata, or even Les Adieux, the sonata of the farewells, um, all of these, or the tempest, all of these are poetic, they are evocative, they send our imagination into overdrive. Whereas Hammerklavier says absolutely nothing about the music apart from the fact that it was written for this instrument. And with the same uh, with just much a justification, we could have called the Ninth Symphony Big Orchestra, because on the title of the Ninth Symphony stands a symphony for a big orchestra. So, um, if I could choose a title, I would go with either the Titanic or, more simply, the Great, like Schubert's uh, incomparable symphony in C. Anyway. This is a work of symphonic proportions. It is over 40 minutes in length. It is in unparalleled completely, uh, not only by anyone before Beethoven, but even by Beethoven himself. And Beethoven took great pain to unite this huge sprawling work into one very tight, cohesive whole. So the devices which he used are twofold. On one hand, the structure. The structure in itself can be seen from two different perspectives. One as a linear progression. We have the opening first movement, which then forms a link to the scherzo. Both are energetic and bright. The scherzo is lighter and more impish. The first movement is more steadfast and uh, with both feet firmly on the ground, but they are obviously from the same uh, source of inspiration. Then from that light and energy we go to the deepest of sorrows and some of the darkest passages that Beethoven has ever written in the slow movement. Then in the introduction to the finale we gradually reawaken, we come back from this sorrow and we reach the light and the triumph in the fugue which in this view of the sonata is the aim of the entire thing. But simultaneously, there is exquisite symmetry in the sonata. The first movement and the fugue are roughly the same length, 
as are the scherzo and the introduction to the fugue. So we have the two large movements at the outward edges of the sonata, then going in we have two short movements, and then in the center we have the incredibly long slow movement. So it is like an arc with the slow movement in the center. And if we look at the slow movement, there we'll see that it in itself has a the same kind of five-part symmetry. And when we discuss the um, slow movement, I will show the passage which lies at the very heart of the sonata, so the center of the central movement. And of course, neither of these um, views of the structure is wrong or right at the expense of the other. They work simultaneously, helping support the, uh, this uh, huge musical canvas. So this is one thing which Beethoven uses to unite the work. The second has to do with the motive of a third. It's a basic musical block, the third, which of course we find in any kind of uh, music, both by Beethoven and everybody else. But here there is a demonstrable and consistent use of the third as an almost obsessive motive which permeates the music from the beginning until the end. So this I will show now. The very opening of the sonata so we have first our jump from this note to this which is a rising third and then we have the falling third which complements the rising one. Then immediately in the next section we start with which is a variant which Beltran will use. So it's, it is also a third but this one, he f this time he fills it with a passing note. And again And as we go through the first movement, we find these thirds in every possible form and way. They will be as part of the melodic motives, they will be as part of the accompaniment, as counterpoint, but also structurally, whole sections will be constructed using sequences of thirds. Then in the scherzo, we find the exact same thing. So it starts with a rising, third, which immediately then is answered by a falling third. And so on. Then the beginning of the slow movement. And I'll play it not in the way it's written now, but in the way it was in Beethoven's manuscript until just a short while before pu publication. So it does start with a third, but just a falling one. But a short while before publication, he sent a letter to the publisher instructing to add a bar before that opening. And that bar is... So two things happen here. First, Beethoven transformed a beautiful ending into a breathtakingly deep one, because the atmospheric power of these empty, hollow octaves is hard to overstate, but simultaneously he has once again completed the pair of thirds. So we have now a rising third and the same third will now fall. Once again, completing the uh, usage of third pairs. Um, the um, development section of the slow movement is all based on a sequence of thirds. And these, these sequences of thirds, which I mentioned twice now, they are at their clearest in the transition from the slow movement to the fugue, and this is the place where I want to show them. 
In the sketchbooks of Beethoven, we see his original idea for this introduction, and it is nothing but a skeleton of falling thirds, uh, many, many, many in number. And in the final version, it is basically the same, just at a few points in the sequence of falling thirds, he stops and plays a short improvisatory passage, and then he continues. So we start with an F. I'll play it a bit faster than tempo. So F, then we go a third down. So from F to D flat, then a third down, a third down. At this place, he stops and plays a passage. And now we continue our descent in thirds. G flat, E flat, another third to B. Now we have another passage. go back to the third from which we started and this time he descends one third and immediately launches into another passage we're back to our original G sharp we continue and another, and another, and this time he stops on the A. And now we have a build-up passage to the fugue, which is all about falling thirds. So I'll just play the left hand first. Last one is a fourth, and then another third, which then will go into the fugue. So together we might not notice this. Uh, because we have harmonies and we have a sense of progression, but the left hand continues its descent. So if I just play only the thirds which we go through in this short passage, we start with an F. It is almost um, almost a parody of music, but he manages to get this idea, which is again the obsessive use of thirds, and transform it into an, incre an incredible narrative device. Because the sense we have from this movement, as it comes after the deep pain of the slow movement, is of a gradual awakening and of Beethoven trying his way on the keyboard. He tries one chord, then another, a third, stops for a while, plays a little passage, then searches again, and the search all through the thirds finally leads him into the fugue. And the fugue, the fugue's theme, will do the very same thing. It starts with a jump, which is the same third, which we had before. And then it will descend, every time outlining a third. So we... Then from there on it continues. And later in the fugue he introduces another subject. And you probably could already hear the just with a passing note. So this is the second way in which Beethoven unites the work. Um, I'm sorry if I spend too much time discussing such a technical point because this pertains to the 
kitchen of composition. This is something which Beethoven would not necessarily want the audience to know, but this is such a fundamental idea in the piece that I thought it had to be mentioned. Another thing which has to be mentioned, because this is a source of endless trouble, concern and annoyance for all of us performing the sonata, is that this is the only sonata by Beethoven to bear metronome marks by Beethoven himself. And it is therefore extremely unfortunate that these metronome marks are so problematic. So the infamous 138 to the half of the first movement sounds like this, which would mean which is, it is playable, but it is comically fast. It um, robs the music of any kind of space and many passages that are expensive and expansive and beautiful and benefit from a bit of time, they will all be swallowed by this avalanche of energy and drive. So we might say, okay, then his metronome was broken and it was too fast. Fine, but then we get to the scherzo and the slow movement and there in the scherzo the, the metronome is just a little bit on the fast side and in the slow movement the metronome is spot on. So it could not be, we, we cannot say out of convenience that his metronome was broken in the first movement and then uh, was a, bit, a little bit less broken in the scherzo and completely unbroken in the slow movement. Um, another possible explanation comes from Beethoven himself he made arrangements of Scottish folk songs for a publisher in Scotland and he uh, sent them in the post and he attached a letter discussing the arrangements and saying that he added metronome marks to some of these um, songs. And there he writes, of course, these metronome marks at most tell you how to start the piece. Even a few bars in, you may change it depending on the mood and character of the music. So maybe this is also the case here. But even, even so, this, this beginning... Um, I find it... I personally find it too fast. There is a, another consideration. He wrote as a tempo marking Allegro. And we know from his other pieces that he can very happily write prestissimo, vivacissimamente, um, allegro molto, allegro con brio, allegro con fuoco, so all sorts of indications of a very fast tempo. And here he just wrote allegro. Um, again, for me, there is a mismatch between an allegro and this impossibly, almost impossibly fast 138. So there is no resolution to this conundrum. We do not know what he meant. We do not know whether indeed maybe he has heard this in his imagination in this tempo. Also, we do not know whether if indeed he had heard this in this tempo, whether if he had then performed it, whether it would have changed his mind. We have many um, um, examples from other composers, for, for instance Shostakovich, where the tempo markings in the score and their own performances of the piece are two very different metronome markings. Same Rachmaninoff. Uh, if Shostakovich's metronomes are always a lot faster than what he plays, uh, Rachmaninoff's metronomes are always a lot slower than what he plays. So another option that if Beethoven at the time had still been performing, maybe he would have changed his mind. All of this is pure speculation. We do not know. And therefore these metronome marks remain fascinating, unignorable, because they are from Beethoven and they are the only ones we have, but always problematic. And now finally to talk about the music itself. The first movement is the most conventional of the four, perhaps. Um, it is an expanded, very rich and elaborate sonata form, abundance of material, um, using orchestral sonorities freely um, and it, I find it fascinating in contrast to how large and heavy the sonata sounds so much of the first movement lies very high up so for example
just a little bit later on. Sorry. These were the highest notes on Beethoven's keyboard. And this time those weren't single cases where he just reached the high areas and then he sent it back. A large part of the first movement is located in those stratospheric heights. Um, I, I spoke about orchestral sonorities and it is true, but at the same time this piece, the first movement but also the entire sonata, is painfully pianistic. It is visceral. It is Beethoven in his most physical. Um, you can feel the strain of the creative muscles and the way it is then uh, transformed into strain of real physical muscles that have to play this music. But at the same time, a tremendous amount of lyricism and um, even beauty, uh, places like this. So floating, beautiful um, textures. The development gives us a first inkling of what is to come much later in the sonata, and that is polyphonic writing. Here we have not a proper fugue, but a fugato. This is a fugato with pairs of voices. So we have two voices, first giving us a whole exposition, then the third and the fourth voice come in. So all of this was in two voices and now the texture is growing richer and denser every time. And then we have once again a repeat of this beautiful floating section. And now we are going back to the, to the reprise and there is a fascinating textural problem. First, what do I mean by textual problem? Don't we know what Beethoven wrote? No, we do not always know what Beethoven uh, wrote and even in cases like this where the manuscript is extant, sometimes it is impossible to say whether an interesting or problematic place was intended by Beethoven or a mistake or oversight or just our inability to understand how the conventions of musical notation at the time were working. So in this particular case, there is a controversy raging to this day, which is still unresolved. And the controversy is here. We have a transition to the finale. Uh, sorry, to the, to the reprise. So he goes from a center of F sharp to a center of B flat, which is his home key. And the controversy is in the last two bars before the reprise. If we read the score as it's written without any thought, what we get is so an A sharp here. which is striking in its harmonic dissonance. But the other way of looking at it is saying Beethoven at the time used to think not of um, writing the accidentals in every bar, but of tonal centers. And because this is a tonal center going into the key of and the leading note is A natural, so of course he must have meant a natural is a regular dominant chord. So the difference is between on one hand and 
on the other hand. There is no way to resolve this. So here it's not so much a question of right and wrong. Everybody is convinced that they are right. And uh, it is basically up to any musician to decide what they do here. Famously, Schnabel, the first person to record the complete cycle of the sonata said, I don't care whether it actually is supposed to be a natural, I find the A sharp such a stroke of genius that I'm gonna play it. So I don't care if Beethoven actually had not written it, I'm gonna play it. So there you go, a little uh, textual um, a controversy inside the sonata. And from this brilliant orchestral slash pianistic first movement, we go to a much lighter, impish, exciting scherzo. And scherzo in Italian, of course, means a joke. But scherzo also came to be in the hands of Beethoven and later in the hands of the Romantic composers, just a fast and exciting movement which would be in the middle of a symphony or a large sonata. Um, so some scherzi by Chopin, as you know, are dramatic, are dark, so it doesn't necessarily have to be a light or easy joke. But in this case, uh, Beethoven does include a large number of musical jokes in this scherzo. The first one I mentioned already. So this is the rising and falling third, which is like a miniature repeat of the first movement. And you may think, so what? But this is the only case in the entire cycle where the scherzo corresponds with the first movement in such a way. Um, the second um, connection between the first movement and the scherzo is much more interesting. In the first movement, there is a constant tug of power between two tonal centers, B flat and B natural. B natural, as for example, inside a G major um, harmony. So for example, our exposition, of course, starts in B flat with a B flat in the chord, but then later on we move to G major. which has B natural in its center. And the end of the exposition, when it goes back, alights on the B flat, and when it goes to the development, alights on the B natural, and so on and so forth in the first movement. But these are tensions that are on a very large, almost tectonic plate scale in the first movement. In the scherzo, these clashes between the B-flat and the B-natural are much more frequent. Um, and clear is to show, so we start of course with the B-flat. But then uh, very soon we get to this passage. So he's gone to the B natural, B natural, and moving back to the B flat, and straight to the B natural. And later, towards the end of the movement, as if to really, really drive the point home, he writes the following passage. the two notes juxtapose in the most direct way, and then he hesitates. So we were on B flat. Actually, no. B natural. Yes. And then he repeats this B natural fortissimo presto 16 times. This is crazy. And at the last moment he goes to 
to be flat. It is as if he's shouting at us like, do you get this joke? Do you get it? And if not, here, here it is. Um, and then the scherzo, after this incredible occurrence, the scherzo adds as if nothing has happened. So that's um, one part of the joke. The second part of the joke occurs at the transition from the scherzo to the trio. And these two notes are the end of the phrase. They are the full stop, the equivalent of a musical full stop. And then he takes them and uses them multiple times in the scherzo, in the trio. And later. So they are like the repeat of a musical stop in the middle of another phrase saying, actually, this is our musical stop from before, so let's bring it in. Uh, that's another uh, way of uniting the sections, which he has used already once before in the sonata number no. six, where he took the end of the exposition and then wrote the entire development based just on those three notes. It is almost like he was showing off, saying, look, I can take the most empty material and make great music out of it. And this idea of using empty material to great made music is how the entire trio works, because our melody is just a broken chord. It's nothing. And yet he manages to transform it into real atmospheric music. And then the same thing in the left hand. So that's another little bit of showing off. And for me, the fact that he manages to create real exciting music from this kind of empty material is uh, inspiring and wonderful. And then the last bit of joking, which he does in this scherzo, is an absolutely extraordinary occurrence between the trio and the scherzo, because in theory the trio should lead back to the scherzo. But here he writes something completely different. So the trio ends. Where did this tune come from? From nowhere. It is presto, it is catchy and it is moreover in the wrong meter. The scherzo is in three. And this tune is in two. Then he writes a kind of umpa umpa variation, which please excuse the, the anachronism is almost like a, a chase scene in a silent movie and the way the pianist would accompany it. And then uh, one last, more serious uh, repeat of this theme. Now he falls down the keyboard in a series of thirds. And then he crosses the entire keyboard in less than 3-4 seconds. Then a silence. A shuddering tremolo. And the scherzo comes back as if nothing has happened. This is miraculous <laughs> in terms of... Um, we often think of Beethoven as a grumpy, grouchy man, but so much humor inside the music can only show that this kind of humor was also inside him. The slow movement leaves, however, all jokes aside and with utmost sincerity and with his heart completely exposed, Beethoven takes us on some kind of exploration of human solitude, melancholy, sadness. Um, it is perhaps the longest slow movement which Beethoven has written and it is, in my opinion, the one movement which grabs 
the listener most if the listener doesn't know the sonata. This is the movement which doesn't require any kind of explanation. E is F sharp minor, which is unique among Beethoven works. And even for Mozart, uh, there is only one movement, the famous slow movement of the A major concerto. Um, also filled with melancholy. If in the case of Beethoven it is like a Sicilian, in the case of, sorry, if in the case of Mozart it is like a Sicilian, in the case of Beethoven it is closer to some kind of um, Barcarolle perhaps. Very long phrases, the, only the opening section is nearly three minutes long. Out of this darkness he often comes into little sections of light that are always centered around the Neapolitan chord. And usually the Neapolitan chord is the darkest chord available in a minor key. But here these G major sections are real moments of light, but they are short-lived, they always then close and darken. And again later going even higher. the darkness of the home key. And after this big opening section in F sharp minor, he stays in the same key and writes another theme in the home key. But this one, if the first one had this very slow protracted movement, this one has an almost waltz-like accompaniment. And this waltz, which today we might call Valse Triste in its mood, supports a right hand of unbelievable freedom This kind of line could have been written by Chopin. This kind of singing figuration above a steady accompaniment and it becomes even more in the, in the reprise. Then uh, we do have a moment of brightness. And another theme, this time in major. And so it goes on and we still haven't finished the first part of the second movement. This is a movement where I think both for the performer and perhaps for the listener, leaning back and just almost in a meditative fashion allowing ourselves to be absorbed by the music is the most satisfying uh, listening experience. Um, there is some kind of timelessness, some kind of suspension of flow and time, um, a dreamed or um, imagined world which is outside, so far outside the present, visceral, 
um, ebullient energy of both the first movement and scherzo and the fugue. And I mentioned before the symmetry that we have the outer movements, then the scherzo in the introduction, and then the middle movement in the center, and the middle movement exhibiting the same kind of five part symmetry. And the section which is the core of the entire sonata, not just by length, but even by the number of bars if we count. And of course, it's hard to say whether this kind of thing is premeditated, but perhaps it was because it is so clear here. The heart of the sonata is the following passage. believe it or not, is a very elaborate variation on the very opening. Just with four notes for every one of the single notes in the beginning. This is the most emotional, the most exposed, vulnerable. This is pain which bursts out of him and cannot be um, held back. There are two moments of ritardando in the movement, moments where the music, which is already quite slow, he instructs it to go even slower. It is a real a draining of all energy. And the first time it happens, he manages to bestir himself, to rouse himself, and he goes once again into the Waldstriest. Which this time is in a brighter major key. But the second time it happens, he goes into a coda. And from there on, it's this gentle glow of the F-sharp major chord. So he does manage to find solace towards the end of this incredible, incomparable movement. And as we already uh, spoke about before, from this static end, he gradually rouses himself via this improvisatory largo. And this I all showed before. But in terms of dramaturgy, in terms of how to structure the sonata, what to do after the adagio, which is over 17 minutes long and which puts us in a real trance. You cannot from this go directly to a fugue which is fortissimo and in B-flat major. Um, so he used this largo, which in itself is unique or almost unique. There's one example in Mozart as well of a slow introduction following a slow movement. So he uses this largo in a masterful way to uh, bridge the sorrowful veil, veil which he passed, sorry, the sorrowful veil which he passed in the slow movement and the 
finale. And having passed this sorrowful veil, he does come through it with an answer, and the answer which he brings is a fugue. And a fugue might seem unexpected here, because the fugue is often seen as an academic device. It is something which is learned, it is something which is uh, brain-oriented and um, could be seen as cold, detached. Of course, knowing the many fugues by Bach, we know that this is not the case, but fugue definitely, the, the fugue definitely has a somewhat um, studied scholarly association with it. Whereas here, the fugue which Beethoven writes is the, it is, it, it is an impossible contradiction. On one hand, it is a scholarly fugue, and I'll show you all the devices which he uses here. So there is augmentation and double augmentation, and there is retrograde, so the, the, the theme appearing from the end to the beginning, and there are stretti, and there will be a second subject, so it will become a double fugue. So everything possible to incorporate from the textbook of fugue writing is here. But at the same time, this fugue is a device for a stream, a, a burst, a fountain of undetainable life energy which bursts forth from Beethoven. As if having passed that sorrow in the slow movement, he has reached the conclusion that the answer is life. And uh, this life bursts forth out of him via this fugue. So we had three entrances, and this is indeed, indeed a fugue for three voices, which he even titles in the fugue itself, a, three, a fugue for three voices with some liberties. And by, liber by, by writing some liberties, which is the same thing which he uh, wrote in the um, Große Fuge, a fugue which is the only one surpassing this one as a vehicle of incredible expressive power, um, it means that he gave himself the freedom to withstand attacks by those that would say, yes, but in fugue writing you should do this or you should not do that. And he said, yes, this is fugue writing which has another purpose than just following the textbook. It is 10 minutes in length and this energy of the um, semi-quavers, it generates itself it's like wave upon wave of um, drive and life force and energy coming from itself. And every time you would feel that it might go down, there is either an episode and then it comes back, or he just manages by, uh, by the force of another entry to bring the energy back. And with a few little episodes, this energy will continue un restrained until the end of the movement and of the sonata. So which interesting devices he uses here? Um, the first, which is uh, worth showing, is an augmentation and a double augmentation. So he writes the same theme, but twice as slow. So we have... I play it with both hands together, then it's easier um, to see. Um, a bit of position. Here it starts. So this is pum 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 pum. It is what we had here. Mm -hmm. Just instead of we have 
And then later he does it even twice slower, but just for the first notes. So he, he stretches it four times altogether. Um. And then here. And again here. This is quite an extraordinary section by itself, this um, towering of trills, quite harsh and dissonant, but it is brought about by the double and then the quadruple uh, slowing down of the theme. Then the next device we have is retrograde. And retrograde is taking the theme note by note and playing it from the end to the beginning. So that if you don't look at it through the score, you cannot really know that this is what's happening, especially in such a long theme as here. So the section sounds like this. You probably did not notice the theme at all, but if I play it from the end to the beginning, we get... and so on and so forth. This is just playing from the end of this section, so that the beginning of our section is the end of the theme. Um, and here he uses this very academic device as a reason to construct a beautiful section in minor, which gives us a little bit of a reprieve from the press of the energy in the other sections. Um, then we have a second theme. Which then gets its own exposition. Um, almost two or three minutes of music and then it becomes a double fugue. So at the end of this section, which is in a different key, there's a wonderful transition. And here we have our main theme. But we have also the second theme. So it's... Both of them together, and of course with a bit of left hand as well. And again... And even two voices in the right hand. And then the left hand does the second theme, while the right hand continues with the first theme. Um, then we have a stretto, so two voices playing almost simultaneously, just with a small offset, with one of the voices playing the theme as written, and the second one playing it as a mirror image. So every interval which goes up in the theme goes in the, in the mirror image down. And it is here. Um. So we have offset by uh, half a bar. And this is the climax of his use of um, academic devices. But again, this also serves not just an academic purpose, but the purpose of what can we do after seven minutes of incredible fugue writing to make it even more exciting and also more complex and more difficult. It is an intensification of everything that has come before. And then towards the end um, of the fugue, there is a moment of um, shadow.
it seems to stop. And then we have just a trill. Again. Now let's bring some energy back. But maybe not. Yes. And the ending of the fugue is a manifold repeat of this initial jump, which is of course our third. And thus ends perhaps the greatest, definitely the greatest in scale and one of the greatest sonatas Beethoven has ever written. I have a feeling that this sonata may perhaps be more enjoyable to play than to listen to. I remember as a kid I could not connect with it as a listener, whereas other um, well, of course, the famous sonatas, the Appassionata, the Waldstein, but also the late sonatas, they had an immediate M impact. Whereas here, the Hammerklavier, I could never connect with it. But as soon as you start playing it, as soon as you dive into this world, um, it is overwhelmingly exciting. And there is such fierce pleasure in fighting against these almost inhuman pianistic challenges and seeing how Beethoven had to overcome these challenges himself in order to go on with his uh, uh, with developing his creative genius and then of course the incomparable slow movement with that without any doubt um, can grab us from the very first but um, playing it remains an incredible joy